just like OEE measures the effectiveness of your lines, your equipment, OLE, overall labor effectiveness, checks where are we wasting manpower and direct labor resources. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video is about overall labor effectiveness, which is like the little brother or maybe even the bigger brother to OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. Now, OEE gets a lot of spotlight and that is because it is easier to measure than labor effectiveness. I can spoil that, but also it's sort of sexy. You know, your machines have to work constantly and having labor be effective all the time, it is not such a clear cut thing that this is good or not. From a cost side, definitely, yes. Direct labor is one of the main costs, one of the, the main parts of your cost of goods sold, of your conversion cost. So you want to control it, you want to be able to reduce it when needed. But on the other hand, we are talking about people. So the idea that we just let people work harder, harder and harder, that is not always as popular. You have to reduce the waste, but not you know, push the, the last little bit of life out of your people. But that's the same as with OE, because when we are looking at machine effectiveness, we're also not pushing and pushing and pushing to increase the nameplate capacity. Now, when we know that the machine can safely be at a higher speed setting, we call not putting it at that speed a speed loss, and we try to fix it. But most of our effort is put into all these waste categories. We're not trying to run that machine to death, we're trying to remove obstacles. And that's the same thing with overall labor effectiveness. Now, let's take a look at how it is built up. And from there, you know, what type of waste do we spot there? And how do we want to measure them, track it, and then sort of set standards and, and improvement plans on that? There is a thing though, especially with labor effectiveness, we don't always want to eliminate all of those wastes, all of those inefficiencies. But we'll get to that when we get there. Now, the picture of your labor cost, and then specifically this one, it combines your OEE with your OLE. We have here in the green and red our basic OEE. And so this machine is probably about 60% or so OEE, and we've got about 40% of machine losses. Those are those things like your setup and uh, your breakdowns, your cleaning, your speed loss, things like that. So this is the machine effectiveness. Now, what we need to get to a labor effectiveness is just like nameplate capacity, we need to determine sort of the, the base number. And for labor effectiveness, that is a Manning norm. So what that basically means is when the line is running, how many people do you need at that one time? Right? So I'm not talking in shifts or uh, we need some backups because you know training and, and illness. No, when the line is running, how many people need to be at different places along that line? And this really is the, the type of, you know, we've got one person filling the machine, we've got one operator, and then we've got one person stacking our pallets, so that's three people. And if you want to get a bit more noodly, and especially when your labor efficiency increases, this is definitely worth doing, you will get to things like, we've got a filler, we've got a palletizer, yes, but the operator actually does two lines. So it's half an operator, two and a half people. Or even closer and more fractional ways of splitting people, but as a start, don't go overboard too much. Work in whole and half people, basically. So when we then say that there are, and let's just keep the free people, right? We got our free people and we did 60% effective OEE. So of our eight hour shift, uh, we uh, have employed eight hours times three people. So that is 24 people, but at the 60% mark, we've got about, what is it, 60%, it's 15 or 16 or so hours of the effective machine time times the Manning norm is 
the zero loss for our manning. Now, when we're thinking overall labor effectiveness, this is like the, the zero waste. This is all added value. The percentage of time that our machine was running effectively, the OE percentage, times the manning norm, which is the number of people. Now, we compare that to the total labor cost. If we see that this shift, for instance, we had five people walking around, eight hours, so that's 40 hours in total. So we've got our 15 effective hours, or zero loss for manning, effective man hours were 15, divided by 40, that is a pretty low 30 percentage overall labor effectiveness. A first chunk that goes out of here, and this is always very good to get this basic concept first, a big part of our manning loss comes from the machine losses. So these here, nine-ish hours, uh, th that is three hours of time from the shift, times three people, are basically the machine losses of labor. When we are increasing you know, labor effectiveness per se, we're not looking at those too much. We try to increase OEE, that automatically generates that we don't need to put in so many man hours as well. But then you saw, if I have a whole shift of three people, that's only 24. We didn't have three people, we had five people walking around. So there is this extra capacity of labor that we have walking around. And this is where we get the last categories of your labor effectiveness. Now, a couple of those people were not walking around. In fact, I hope for your company that many of the people that you did have in your total labor cost were not per se walking around at every moment. But we'll see that when we get into the loss categories. See, people who are on vacation or at home sick, they are not even next to your line. But you do need to replace them and at the same time pay for the original people's salaries. Right? That is the social contract we have in almost every country. If you work with staffed uh, employees, you pay for their vacation and sick leave. So they are in the total labor cost. They weren't even at the factory at the moment, but you still needed to run the lines. We are in a bit of the manning loss. Now for things that are actually happening generally within our factory. We got a couple of things that are not really linked to the line. Right? We're, we need to train people. Maybe we need to train them to work on this line. But somebody who is training uh, is away from direct service, so that that time is not used at the moment. Here we do have to split out a bit. See, when you are really in a classroom away for training, it's dry cut, right? That, that is away for training. When you have two people on one person's place or one operator's place because one of them is training the other one, you also say the extra person training hours. At some point, you will probably be far enough along in the training that you let this new operator or to-be operator work on their own. At this moment, they might still be in training, but you are not double planning them anymore. So those hours just go into your normal OEE, right? So as soon as somebody is technically still training, but is no longer double planned for that, these are not labor losses due to training. And admin and all kinds of management tasks. This again, it depends on who you include in your total labor pool. Most people, most companies include in the total labor cost, only the direct labor and supervisors, team leaders, production manager, uh, people like that, it is 
really company to company, do they fall under direct labor or indirect labor? This is part of, you know, where do we put those boundaries? But if you put supervisors into direct labor, which is quite a common practice, they are generally not at the line. So they are in management. But we also, from time to time, have operators with a double role. Maybe we have them in a TPM pillar. Maybe we have them in a project or something like that. You know, we still pay the operator, but they are doing some other task than running the line. They may very well be improving that same line or helping other people, but it's not running the line. They are administrative tasks. If you want to, especially projects, better to split out because generally you can put those hours onto the project budget and then they become investments, interesting for your company. But the main point here is when somebody is not at the line, but they are still paid at that moment because they are doing managerial admin project type of tasks, do split that out. Show if labor is an important cost for you and you want to get some grip on it, show where you spend the labor. And then there's a couple of different labor tasks. I will add two more, but they are sort of indicative of a number of tasks that really happen sort of within the production organization. And those are filling in for colleagues breaks and AM tasks. And what I mean with filling in breaks is that for many lines that are at capacity, it's very interesting to have a couple extra people around in your labor pool to make sure that when the operator goes for lunch, the replacement gets there to the line, takes over the machine and makes sure that the machine keeps producing. You can also have these breaks not filled in. So especially when your line is not at peak capacity, you've got some machine time left. It can be much more interesting economically to not have extra operators stand by, but just you know, shut down the lines for a bit, go have your coffee break, come back. Then it becomes an OAE loss or a machine loss, right? Then you say the line was down for 15 minutes, those three operators who were manning the line were also all free away for 15 minutes. So that is a 15 minute machine loss times your manning or more free is a 45 minute break basically. The thing is, if you have somebody to relieve all those breaks, they generally don't really fill up the eight hours, but they also, they need vacation, they need all kinds of things. It is generally a bit more expensive but it will get you a line that has more runtime. It can be very, very interesting. The other thing, AM tasks. So when we say cleaning time, that is generally you know, in the machine losses and, and everything directly linked to the line where you stop the line and then the same crew does things, right? Uh, cleaning, maintenance, stuff like that. It's, it's generally covered by these machine losses, but I can also fully imagine that you have somebody extra during cleaning, you can put it under here. If this is really something you have in your organization, you might want to split it out in a specific one. But also we can ask operators to do AM autonomous management, autonomous maintenance tasks during their shift while they're working the line. But quite often we will also need a bit more time. We'll need some extra time where the operator is not at their own line to, uh, they're not running that line, you know, to do inspections and cleanings and, and all kinds of small things to improve you know, the workplace, the line, those things you also want to capture. These are operator tasks, but they are not running that line. So they're not in any of the machine hours per se. So those things, they give you a good sort of way to, to manage to slice this block of additional hours, right? That gap we had between what is really effective time times the manning. So the zero loss for manning, your effective man hours, and the total labor cost you had. Big part of it is generally explained by the machine losses times the manning, but then there is still 
this extra manning capacity. Vacation, depending on where you're from, this is always a big one, right? So vacation is somewhere between 7 and 17 or so percent, depending on rules of your company, your country, and the general culture you have. Sick leave you know, is also a couple of percents, generally. So they are a big chunk of your extra time. But the thing is, when you just say, oh, well, you know, we've got one supervisor, that's, that's an extra, and uh, then we have, uh, let's say, 20% of vacation, sick leave, absenteeism in general, no, that, that, that's about right. You are missing very good opportunities to optimize your total labor spend. Really splitting it out into also the training hours, all kinds of admin and management tasks that you ask operators to do. Do we have people you know, taking over machines, doing AM tasks? Because this means if we have it, then there is capacity in the labor pool. But also important, if we are doing these and somebody has the brilliant idea that you know, we now have these uh, four operators on four lines, we're going to install one or two more lines and you know, basically those four operators should be able to do five or even six lines. So in our project, we're expanding capacity. We plan to not expand the labor force because we know that the operators on those, the current four operators on the four lines, they are you know, really busy all of the time. That can really work, but if you see that the time that they're not really, really at the line because you know, they have some time to fill each other's gaps and you know, Frank will watch Sarah's line a bit when she goes on a break. If that is happening, you really want to have this registration because maybe the time is actually pretty full. You know, if you've got a 90-95% use of the time anyway, as soon as you put an extra line there, things are going to break. Right? So those are also reasons why you want to know. But the main reason, of course, is you set sort of your own limits, your own strategy on each of these. And you want to know what your people are spending their time on, because that is also the things you pay people for. And the time fills up, right? If you, <laughs> there's this pretty nice saying, that the work expands to meet the allotted time. That also happens on the shop floor. And by checking what we're doing, we also know where we should be able to cut, where we can automate to free up time for the things we would like to add on top. Be it an extra line, be it making room for those AM tasks that we're not doing yet, preventive type of small maintenance, things like that. Many companies try to find time from the current labor pool. That's why you split it out in these things. Now, where do you find it? Generally, vacation, sick leave, they are registered, if not by HR, then by the team leaders. This is part of your whole planning, right? And I hope you are also registering sick leave, but vacation is definitely registered in basically any company. Training time, not always registered, but the place where I most often find it when we do a, a loss analysis at, at a factory is in the, uh, in the planning, in the personnel planning. These, however, the AM tasks, they are almost always split very difficult to find, so you'll have to do some activity checking. Just walk with your operators, see what is happening on a daily basis. But the whole process of filling in for breaks, do we do admin or management? Do we have people for it? That is generally known by supervisors and team leaders. Just have a chat with them. This is not often, not, not in many companies, registered really explicitly. But when you have a talk, when you say, okay, but what is this fifth man in this shift doing? Well, that fifth man is actually there to do this break, this break, this break. Then uh, he changes uh, the, the, all of the hygiene zones. Uh, then he gets some stuff from logistics. And then, of course, it's already lunch. He does that, that, that. And when people tell it to you like that, it's your job to translate that into, ah, right, he's doing about five hours per eight-hour shift of filling in other people's breaks. Uh, he's doing about one and a half hours of AM tasks. Oh, he also has his own break. 
and it does a couple of management things. And you also fill it in like that. Those are really good for a basic understanding of what are we spending our time on. And they will also allow us to say, look, if we can get the OEE higher, what is actually going to happen? Can, can we remove shifts and then also get rid of that or not? Do we have to swap things around a bit? Can we maybe draw stuff from machine loss into manning loss? That's what we talked about at the beginning when I said, if right now you just pause your machines when your people go on a break, that is an option to work through the breaks with a nice rotating pattern. You'll need a bit of extra manpower, but you'll get capacity from your machine. Might be very economically interesting. Things like that is why you need this combo. And when you do a loss analysis and you can link OEE with how many people should be on that line and link that up to the total labor cost, especially this part here is very interesting for uh, production managers, plant directors, people like that to know how many people do we have just to run the line, including all of the losses. So how many extra people do we have hanging around? Now, if that is just vacation and sick leave, okay, logical. But if we are then still left with a whole bunch of FTEs, they will want to know what are we doing. Cost control, but also opportunities. So that is why go for also exploring your labor effectiveness by splitting out that extra time into categories. Put some strategy, those some targets on these, see where the opportunities are, and then improve your overall labor effectiveness. Now, I will say that when we are looking at this, the sort of order that is generally best to improve your overall labor effectiveness, but to, to decrease your labor spent, is first get that OEE nice and high. If you got an OEE of under 50%, definitely number one. If you've got an OEE of somewhere around 80%, probably you really need to look at the other factors. What is generally the second good one is to really take a strong look at all of those extras that we're doing. And as a third one, we look at the Manning norm. Can we reduce the number of people at the line by making the work a bit smarter? Now, I will say, if you have what I had in my uh, example, right? Somebody putting boxes on a pallet, this is actually a type of work that can be very easily automated. Uh, when you put a palletizing robot in place, you generally don't fully save one FTE because that one person can generally also get rid of the pallets for you but you save about 90% easily of the time because somebody else just has to get rid of the pallets. And maybe that 10% is within the others, right? Maybe you can free it up. But things like that, yes, go for that quickly and take a quick hit to that labor cost. But in general, first OEE, then check, do we have strange categories here? And then we reduce the Manning norm by re-engineering. So I hope that this, and it's been a long time coming, but is a nice companion to my don't just look at labor cost per ton, but check OEE, check labor effectiveness. I promised to split it out. This is that split. I hope it gives you a new tool in your arsenal to attack the waste in your factory and get more effective, get a world-class operation if it did, or if it just you know, made you think about what you can do in your next loss analysis, do hit that like button. And also write me a comment below if you want me to explain any part of this or, or maybe something linked to it that you would like to know. There's also a couple of tools, for instance, how to track what we can do with making it easy, making the labor more effective and, and freeing up you know, walking time, freeing up uh, the obstacles for people to really do their work that, that they should be doing. 
by removing waste in what they do. Is it interesting? Let me know. For now, I wish you the best of luck in your continuous improvement. And as always, don't forget to enjoy the continuous improvement journey.